you have to create a safe, positive space where people can feel vulnerable. And if you have negativity, if people don't feel safe, if they feel judged, if they're, they're not, not going to do it, they're not going to make any offerings. And if they can't be vulnerable, then they can't connect. And if they can't connect... And so that's how I want my, you know, anywhere I go to be, like my house with my kids, like I want it to be a safe space where people can take risks and people can say things and they're not going to be judged and no one's going to gasp or no one's going to, people can feel vulnerable. Life gets easier if we figure it out together. Welcome to The Lisa Show. Haley Smith is an actress, a singer, an improviser, a writer, a producer. She's a mom. She's my really good friend. Welcome. Hi, Lisa. Hi. How are you? I'm so good. good. I'm happy that you're here because every time that I can see you, you have such a great energy and spirit about you, honestly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're so sweet. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you about, so I'm just going to. Okay. When people say, oh, you're an improviser, <laughs> you know. Yeah. N- nobody really understands what that means unless you're an actor, right? Mm, so yeah. how do you explain improvisation to people? <laughs> well, yes, I have had many experiences where people introduce me as like, oh, this is my friend Haley. She does that impromptu stuff. <laughs> oh, impromptu, even or, better. Or they're like, um, can you come and, you know, like do your, imp- your impromptu for like, you know, just for like the young women or whatever, for whoever, for a group of people. And, you know, just come and do like 15 minutes. And I'm like... Wait, what? <laughs> like yeah. I I don't do stand up. <laughs> right. So, I don't yeah. have a type five. Exactly. But, mm-hmm. Like I yeah, a lot of people definitely are still not as familiar with what improv is. But really the best way to explain it to people is um you're just making stuff up and playing. <laughs> and then they're like, Oh, that's cool. <laughs> no, they have you have to see it. You have yeah. to see it, I guess. To believe it. What do you wish people knew about it, though? Like, really understood. You've got the time now to really explain, like, the love of it. Um, Well, the love of it for me is because it's just so exciting to to create something. Well, first of all, we're creative beings, right? Like, we've all come here to just we love to create things that's just who we are and so just the to have the ability to create something that has never been seen before um create a story create a character create a song um and then it will never be seen again in most cases with improv and so there's just something so exciting and pure about that form Um, you can't fake it. (laughs) You have to be completely in the moment, which I think so much in our lives is about either dwelling in the past or just worrying about the future. And so just to be completely present is a gift, I think. And just to be able to get to do that with your best friends, if you get to do that. (laughs) I mean, what isn't there to love about (laughs) improv? But I think for everyone else, I, you know, I suggest to people, you know, in, in the past, I've done some improv workshops like with kids or even with companies. And really, I think what people take away from it is it's so important to learn how to listen to people. Because in improv, if you're not listening to your scene partner, then you have no business doing it. You may as well sit down because you're not you're not focused. You're not going to be able to respond appropriately. You're not going to be able to... Um, have a successful story if you're not paying attention to every single thing they're saying and doing and their reactions and everything. And so I think especially today in a world where we have so many distractions with with our phones and everything and you, you you've all we've all been in conversation with someone and they're like looking at their phone or they're looking around for someone else to talk to <laughs> or something. We're just all so distracted <laughs> that really for people to learn the art of just listening to people, is is huge. Yeah. I think. And it's something we all need to work on. Learn it's like a, a practicing learning being in the moment mm-hmm. and listening mm-hmm. is a different way to describe improv than I think a lot of people yeah. would would use like that kind yeah. of definition. And yeah. I, I it's an interesting point that you bring up that 
what's unique about theater in general Mm -hmm. and improv in particular is that it never exists again. You know, with Mm -hmm. music and visual art and dance. Mm -hmm. Some, well, actually, dance is kind of like theater, right? Like you just create something, and it's just it exists in that time and in that moment. Mm You know, forever, who is ever watching in that moment, and then it's gone. Mm-hmm. You you don't watch yeah. it over again. I mean, even yeah, even live theater. Like if you're really doing, you know, the the piece justice, then you're really like living and breathing as much as possible in the character, even if you're doing it every night. You know, so hopefully each audience is kind of getting a slightly different, you know, performance, and so yeah, it's unique those live performing arts. Yeah. And and it is often misunderstood, as you said in the beginning, of that some people are like, is it's comedy, just be funny. Like improv yes. is usually always associated with mm-hmm. with comedy. I mean, mm-hmm. I think the way that I explain it is, is I think that sometimes it ends up being funny because life is funny. And if you're yeah. really listening and being in the moment and just yeah. mirroring life, life is ridiculous. Life is ridiculous. <laughs> and that might just I, I mean, be me. co- I mean we, comedy <laughs> comes from truth, right? So really the the best way to make people laugh is to just surprise them with, <laughs> with truth. <laughs> here's a truth bomb. I mean, we're be- I'm being constantly surprised by truth every day <laughs> in my life. And I don't always laugh at it at first. But then later. <laughs> later. But I think if we can make, you know, an audience, we can surprise them with some truth that they haven't, you know, really thought about in that way. They're like, oh, I guess I can laugh at that because I'm in a safe place in this audience. And I'm, no one's going to ask me to get on stage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or will, or will we? we? So what are some of your favorite ways to practice improv? Like your favorite games or just um, workshops? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's lots of, I mean, I i don't know. I've been doing improv for I like know, over 20 forever. years. I know this is why you're yeah. the perfect person to ask. <laughs> because you've done short form, long yes. form, different yeah. kinds of games, different approaches. Right. What, what are some of your favorite? Yeah, for sure. Um, so actually when I first started improv, like the first improv class I ever took, I didn't even, my teacher didn't even approach it from a place of comedy at all. Like everything we did was really like grounded and serious. And so I actually really still love those kinds of exercises where you're just trying to, um, create a character, a person that that you might know or that, you know, like, how does this person, I love physical stuff, you know, mm-hmm. like, how does this person, um, like, what, I don't know, some, some things you can do is what body parts does this person, you know, emphasize? Do they walk with their hips forward? Do they lead with their neck? Or um, those are all physical things. Or like, what animals? I love animal imagery. <laughs> Like, it's just it's so fun. It's all the things yeah. that people make fun I know. of actors for. I know. I like, know. Like, I remember <laughs> when uh, when Chris was doing, um, like, his graduate degree, yeah. and people would be like, do you just, like, run around, like, acting like a cow and a chicken <laughs> and a monkey? And he was like, no, it's serious. Yeah, yeah, actually, we just did that. <laughs> We well, he's like I took a breath class one yeah. time and his brother was like he took a whole class on breathing and he's yes. like yeah and when I say it out loud it sounds kind of lame but it was really cool I know and it's actually, about my note yeah you know and actually one of my favorite like physical character things that I ever learned and that I've ever used I learned from Chris Christopher Clark and it's Laban and it's oh. where yeah there you can be like you can have someone who's um, direct and light or like indirect and heavy. Like there's all those things. So I have I got to be a part of some fun improv uh, classes during the pandemic. And we did a lot of that kind of work where you're creating a character. And so you're just looking, you're like, hmm, give me an animal or give me a Laban or give me, you know, like a, an emotion. And so um, that kind of stuff I think is really fun because I'm not like, you know, I don't know. I'm not always one who's like Lisa Clark, who's like, I just have 10 characters in my oh, back stop. pocket. 
just I just am out. obsessed with people watching. I, That's the thing. And I, I do appreciate working with other improvisers yeah. because you can see they have a different love of, of different parts of yes, improv. Yes. And, and, you know, you nailed yeah. it. I love characters. <laughs> I'm the one that, like, as a little kid, just wanted to sit in the mall and watch people go by sitting next yes. to my dad. And he's always like, wasn't, you know, isn't people watching amazing? You know, and at Disneyland, you just, I just want to watch people yes. and I watch them interact and move. And, and that's, yeah. so that's funny that you should say that, but there are different ways, yeah, to train to, if, yeah. if you're like, I just want to come up with somebody absolutely different. Uh-huh. You can start with like, yeah, that this physical aspect, uh-huh. a word, emotion. Yeah. Uh, well, and I love, I love stories. I love hearing people tell stories because you can always get good character ideas. Like when, whenever anyone, whenever I hear someone tell me a story about some, just something that someone they knew, something that they did that was just blew my mind. I just make them tell it over and over and over again. <laughs> and, you know, I'm really, it, it's entertaining, but I'm also like, I've got to figure out like this character, like that's such a great character. Like mm-hmm. I need to know all about this person. But, but then also just like storytelling in general, I've just, since I was a little girl, I've always like written stories and just like laid in bed and thought about stories and <laughs> just like all these like characters that existed and didn't really know why I did that. But then <laughs> when you're like, I don't know, in your 40s <laughs> and making up stories, um, you know, for fun or sometimes you get paid to do it, which is fun too, then it kind of, it kind of makes more sense about, oh yeah, there's all these, like, there's just so many stories that can be told and so many stories that resonate with people, whether it's, even if it's fantasy or sci-fi or <clears throat> just, you know, what, anything that's not, maybe not necessarily exactly like their life. You know, everyone can relate to those stories. And I've always been fascinated by that and how we tell them. And yeah. So what has, has practicing improv taught you about storytelling then and more effective storytelling? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that what I've kind of been learning more recently is just that those, if you're, Performing improv, what's most important to the audience is um, setting up the relationships in the stories and the, and just that's where the stories come from. That's what makes the audience care. Like if you have a really exciting story with all of these plot twists and things happening, um, and you could probably like look at your t- favorite TV show, you know, and break it down. But even if you have all these cool things happening and this exciting plot, no one's going to care about it if they don't care about the characters and the relationships. And so that has been kind of <clears throat> really eye-opening for me to be like, oh, yeah, it's not, you don't have to have this flashy story to bring your audience along with you. You just have to win them over with the characters. Yeah, so, making that connection. And I yeah. feel that that's like the strength of any sort of art form. You have to it draws mm-hmm. you in to care about something, reminds you of something in your life, or creates a feeling about mm-hmm. that. How do you do that on stage in improv? How do you create those relationships? Um, listening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think as an audience member, when I'm watching someone do an improv scene or an improv show, it's not supposed to be pre-planned, right? Yeah. So just, I think what we need to be okay with when we're doing improv is to be okay with being patient and finding the character and finding the relationships and not being worried about silence. Like we have silence in real life. And I think if you have those moments, then it makes it more real for the audience. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's fascinating to watch scenes when, or even like in movies and stuff, when maybe not even much is said, but there's obviously so much, if the actors or performers are really tuned in to each other and paying attention and listening and watching, they're just going to, it's just going to be so real and so much more interesting to watch than if someone is just like, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to say this. And they couldn't care less what the other person. Yeah, they're they're not there in the moment with them. That's just not fun to watch as from the outside. And it's certainly a different perspective than a lot of people have who go into improv because there is still this idea of 
like, uh, you know, whose line is it anyway? Mm-hmm. You know, where it's like zing, zing, zing. You want to see how many laughs. And there's, mm-hmm. you can get per minute. Or sometimes when you're performing, there's a lot of that pressure mm-hmm. to, I got to get a laugh. I got to get a laugh. Yeah. And if that's your focus instead of listening and being patient and connecting mm-hmm. with the other person, it's an entirely different yeah. objective. Yeah. So how do you respond when you are on stage with someone who is just thinking about the next zing? <laughs> you know, yeah, because well, you know, yeah. we've, we've all been there. <laughs> it's challenging. It's challenging. Yes, I've definitely been there. I think one thing to not do is try to outperform them. You don't try <laughs> to, you know, like go bigger or, you know. Um, but I think maybe just trying to get them to kind of like recenter. Because a lot of times yeah. people mm. will have that energy because they are, they do have a lot of nerves or they are, they are worried mm-hmm. about what everyone else is doing and they need, to, so they look for a way to control. And so, you know, they're, they just need to like take a deep breath and kind of like come back themselves. I don't, sometimes it's hard to get them to do that in the moment, but I think if you can get anyone to like make eye contact mm-hmm. with you and maybe just like breathe and just like if you can try and kind of try to like slow it all down, then <laughs> now see we all need a breathing class. T- I know. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's for something that you do constantly all day. I mean, shouldn't we all be having a class on it? Come on. Yes, but I mean, we do that <laughs> like with our kids, right? Like if our oh, we yeah. have a teenager that's panicking and freaking out, I mean, you're just like, okay, look at me. And just, okay, let's take some deep breaths, Mm -hmm. right? Or anyone, like that's what people need. They just need to breathe. They need to get some oxygen. Like it's going to be okay. So I think, and you know, a lot of times I have to say, I've been on stage with someone who's been railroading and I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to go sit down. (laughs) But this is an ideal world. This is what I'm going to do next time. Exactly. Let's breathe. And And it's going to be okay. You did mention that you've been doing this for a while, and I yeah. want to I want to know what has surprised you about what you've learned, um, either about yourself or about life by doing improv over the years. Over the years, okay. Well, oh man, I guess one thing that just popped in my head is just like the ability to laugh at myself. I guess <laughs> because I think we just so many of us just take life so seriously, and I get it. Like there are really you know, serious things that happen all the time. But I don't know. I've just always been a really like positive, like glass half full kind of lady. And so, <laughs> and so for, for when I'm around people who are just like, oh, this is the worst or I can't laugh or just everything is so, I'm just like, oh, come on guys. <laughs> like, yeah. Seriously. So I think it's really, because improv, you really have to tap into your inner child is what you have to do. I mean, because adults are so serious and worry and all the time. Play at the yeah, end of the day. Yeah, it's playing. If you just watch a bunch of kids playing, you know, they're not They're like, making up stories. Yeah. They're making up characters. Yeah, they're, they're not like, wait, you guys, I have to do laundry tonight. Oh, I'm no. sad now. Like they're never gonna say that. No. <laughs> so they're just having fun. And that's what you have to get into that space. And we could all use more of that in our lives. Absolutely. To be we need less Grade school children complaining about laundry on the playground. <laughs> I hope no grade school child does that. I know. I just it was a really funny like, image that you just painted. I was like, I was thinking how depressing it would be to see like a nine year old being like, "Oh, you guys, I'd love to play kickball in four square today, but just a second, I gotta go change the and maybe, load." Uh. Maybe it's not laundry they're doing. Maybe it's their homework. But I'm just thinking of like how many times have we been like as adults at lunch with a friend yes. and we're having a good time, but in the back back of our mind, we're like. Oh, I got to work on that project I got those tonight. 12 things to oh, do when I, I get it. home. Yeah, yeah and you're and so, not in the moment. Yeah. You're not, you, yeah. It's, it, and it's still going to be there. <laughs> like yeah, thinking seriously. about it is going to make it go away. <laughs> and worrying so, about it isn't, yeah. there's there's no like a moral yeah. high ground of like, well, I really worried <laughs> and was serious and concerned about this. Yeah. And I worried about it more, so I have more value. Like right. it's so ridiculous when you say it, but right. yet, yeah. There is something that we, like as an, as mm-hmm. adults, that we're like, well, we can't laugh yeah. at, it, at times such as these. Exactly. Yeah. And I, and I think that's what's so great about if you're really doing 
you know, improv correctly, you just let all that stuff go. Just play like a kid, see what you can create, you know, the magic you can create and be able to make mistakes and take risks. And that's as a recovering perfectionist. Oh, amen. <laughs> this is a safe place for both of us. Um, you just, if you're afraid to try new things because you want to be the best at them and you don't want to fail, then you're never going to do anything. And so, and the, it's the same thing in improv. Like you have to just jump out there and maybe start, I don't know, break dancing. I don't know what you your wish. scariest you thing love that. is for <laughs> but like sometimes Pop you just have, or, or yeah, or someone comes up to you and, it's and just is ridiculous like, and you're just going to commit to it. Yeah. Or I remember this one time I was doing a scene with a friend of mine and I came out and I was, I thought I looked pretty cool and I thought I was going to be someone pretty cool. Yeah. You, and, were ma- you made a choice, yeah, but it was and internal. Was like, and then my friend goes, Hey doctor. <laughs> yep. And I was like, Yep, I'm a doctor. I'm a cool and I'm doctor. I'm a cool doctor. <laughs> but you know, who you, who you, cares? You but do you it. Said yes to it. Have I ever been a cool doctor? Oh no, I haven't. <laughs> Not in my real life. Not by any stretch of the characters. imagination. But in that moment, the, we really needed a cool doctor, <laughs> and I was able to do that because I wasn't afraid to try something. <laughs> Yeah, and ridiculous, and that's that's probably a bad example because I'm sure there's. <laughs> it's not a bad example. It's a perfect example because, okay, so do you get this a lot? Uh, people will say, "Oh, I could never do that. I could mm-hmm. never do improv," and wow. and in my mind, I always think you do it every day. Every You're day. doing it all the time. Yeah. It's just making choices. Yes, and I think the the miss calculation in people's mind, the misassessment is, I don't like the pressure of being funny and I can't Mm -hmm. think of things that are funny off the top of your head. And I think Mm -hmm. that's the secret of good improvisers is they're not trying to think, what zinger can I come up with next? What's the next funny thing? They are trying to make it as real as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and we talked about earlier, you know, like pulling from your other... um, partners that you're with, like looking at them, their reactions, yeah, listening you're creating to them. Together. Yeah. But another thing you can do, you can just pull things out of midair. You know, you, like if <laughs> know, you're, so you're really, I mean, you're really Sometimes bad. You have and, to. and, but it's like, don't be afraid of just standing out there and having nothing and then just, you know, oh, what's this in front of me? Oh, it's, I don't know. An old An woman or. in <laughs> old woman. the woods that lives alone and likes right. to make acorn soup. Right. I was going to say an orange, but sure. <laughs> that too. That We're too. both right. They're both, <laughs> they're both right. You could see either of those things in front of you if yep. you just look for them. <laughs> it makes you wonder why that was in front of me and an orange was in front of you. But... We're not psychiatrists. <laughs> That's right. We're not here to analyze. I mean, I could be a cool psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah, you could. In the moment, <laughs> if you needed me to. But I don't know. Just trust yourself because you know. I Well, right? and, yes. And I, I, I feel it in my bones. I, <laughs> I feel this principle because it has helped me as a recovering perfectionist yeah. who just thinks, no, everything has to be okay. And in the early days of doing improv, I would wait in the side and wait for the perfect moment mm-hmm. until I knew something funny to say to mm-hmm. jump into the scene, yeah. you know? Like in college, I would feel that like sort of pressure. And, I, and somewhere along the line, I was tired, I think, of the confidence of other guys Mm -hmm. who would just get out there and they didn't care what they said or what they did. They just Mm -hmm. were doing it. And and you can only wait on on the sideline. This is a great metaphor for life. (laughs) The, the The sideline for so long, just waiting and watching for the perfect moment, it will never come. Yeah, The perfect moment will never come. You just got to get in there and play the game. Did I just make improv also a sports metaphor? <laughs> yes, I think you did. Amazing. Well, it's like Good it's that me. whole <laughs> quote, right? About getting out there. Like the people standing on the sidelines, they don't get to say because they're not out there you just doing it. Right. And so people who say, I could never do that. I'm like, well, you could. I'll try it. But I mean, because is that what you say about your life? Do you stand on the side and think, 
oh, I could never parent teenagers. No, you just do it. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> just, I mean, I can't do it, should. and I'm doing it. But you so, have to do yep. it. So you, you just can't have just to not do it. Do I think it. there's also another misconception. Look at us. I'm okay. peeling back like the misconceptions like of, uh, of improv. Mm-hmm. Since no one asked, nobody uh, asked <laughs> that 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 people who do improv and like to get up there just like attention. Oh, <laughs> and and it's so funny to me because if you if I think about my favorite improvisers, the ones that I are the very best at it, <laughs> yeah, they're kind of like homebodies that just mm-hmm. like to keep to themselves. They don't like it to do it for attention. They like to do it because they have to do it. Mm-hmm. There's something like compelling mm-hmm. them inside. Mm-hmm. To play that way, mm-hmm. and then they re- after they go on stage, they mm-hmm. retreat. Yeah, oh, what is that? Oh, I I know exactly what it is. Here's the thing: if you're a child who's very shy, who's maybe a little bit insecure, who is not sure what it is to be you yet, you know, like you, maybe it could be from your upbringing, it could be just from other outside factors in your life, or it could just be like the way you are. And so you're not really comfortable putting yourself out there with your own opinions and, you know, putting your own stamp on the world yet. You're you're not sure what that means. Oh, man. To have someone be like, oh, well, you go up on this little platform <laughs> and don't be you, be anybody else. And then you're like, oh, Okay, cool. Like, I don't, it has nothing to do with me. Like, I can just be Yeah, you can separate anyone. it. And, and mm-hmm. as another character, I can say whatever I want, and I can have any opinion I want, and it's not me saying it. And so, like, that was me as a kid. You know, I was just, like, terrified to, like, make a scene or have everyone look at me or whatever. But up there, it was different because I wasn't myself. They weren't judging me as a person. And I and over the years, I, I've taught kids improv once, and I had this, this adorable... Like girl, and I'm not saying she was like insecure or whatever, but she would just sit there when while every all the kids were running around and just being crazy, and she'd be reading a book just quietly. <laughs> and then it was time to get on stage, and she steps up there, and she's like shorter than everyone, and she just lights up everything and just takes over. and it, And it's just so I think just freeing for a kid who feels you know a little bit more shy and a little bit more nervous mm-hmm. to just find their power by just. Not caring because they won't be judged for being at someone else, for being a character. It's such a nurturing community. Yeah. You can take risks and take chances yeah. when you are, when, you know, you get up there, you do a voice, a character, a movement, any, any little mm-hmm. tiny offering, mm-hmm. and everyone is leaning in and listening mm-hmm. and offering that kind of support, like when you're doing a workshop or, or whether it's like with the other people that you're improvising with, whatever you offer them, they're not judging it in the moment. They're just taking it, yes, and mm-hmm. they're adding to it. Mm-hmm. And, and you feel that community, and it builds, and it builds, and it builds. And once you have that trust, I remember doing um, you know, improv at the very beginning in college. Once you have that trust, mm-hmm. then it frees you open. Yes. Because yeah. I re- remember doing like a little improv games and thinking, you know, the first few times that I got up, like, oh, that was so dumb. Why did I do that? Mm-hmm. Why didn't I do that? Or, or, or that was good, or that was bad, or like constantly judging, and then mm-hmm. getting to the place after a few months of st- of of ceasing to do that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and not yeah. self-judging every little thing. Yes. I just thought, oh, no, no, you just make a thousand different offerings. Don't mm-hmm. judge them. Just go with it of where it is. You can think about it later. Right. And it is so important if you are, you know, a- as players or in a group or, well, yeah, I'll connect it to other things, but like you have to create a safe, positive space where people can feel vulnerable. And if you have negativity, if people don't feel safe, if they feel judged, if... If they feel judged they for do, every it, offering yeah, that they make, they're, they're not, not going to do it. They're not going to make any offerings. And if they can't be vulnerable, then they can't connect. And if they can't connect... And so really, I mean, I've carried that over into any time I've taught a class, any time, you know, I, I say right at the front, I say, we are in a safe place. You know, everyone, like, let's be respectful when someone's talking. Let's listen to them, give them their full attention. We don't talk while someone else is talking. You know, let's, and then I'm always, I always make sure that I share something 
you know, vulnerable and that, that I kind of set the tone like this is a safe place and I, I'm going to tell you it's a safe place, but I'm going to share something, a story, an experience I had that's really vulnerable. And then other people feel like they can. They're like, oh, okay, this is a safe space. And you cannot have a good improv environment without all of those conditions. Um, and honestly, you can't, like, that's how I want my, you know, anywhere I go to be, like my house with my kids, like I want it to be a safe space where um, people can take risks and people can say things and they're not going to be judged and no one's going to gasp or no one's going to, you know, be negative about it. And like, we can just um, try things and fail and be vulnerable and make those connections. And so I've definitely taken that like into my real life as well. And I've seen that with your kids and the way that they are able to interact with each other. And how great would that be if we all had those kinds of safe spaces, yeah. not just in our own homes, but when you know you carry that over to other different art forms. Like I'm thinking of different friends that I have that maybe don't do improv, but they write music or mm -hmm. they um, are visual artists mm -hmm. or dancers uh, and, and whatever that sort of offering is to understand and be able to recognize that same language. Mm -hmm. That this is something that is a creative process that there are elements of improv in all different kinds of art forms. Absolutely. And you can use it. And it can be like you were saying, by doing workshops like with companies or different groups of people and social clubs or whatever, that these kinds of principles can enhance just the way that they show up and connect to other people, the way that they express life. And I mean, what better tool, yeah. you know, to, to have. it's the insecure English major in me that always feels like they need to sort of justify their degree, which is funny because I went into English because I was more practical than theater. Yeah. <laughs> which, what does that even mean? Uh, how has improv like really strengthened your parenting and your mm -hmm. family? Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, what is the first rule of improv? It's yes. Yes. And right. And and I'm not saying that, you know, I You're a permissive parent. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm yes not saying I do yes day. <laughs> I would never don't do, do that. that. Um, but really, oh man, it, it really there is so much power in just um just giving like positive listening and positive acknowledgement of someone else's feelings and existence. There is so much negative power in denying someone. Give us an example <laughs> of like a denial in a real world experience. Honestly, because yeah. I think that most people don't realize that they're constantly <laughs> knocking down, you know, offerings right. that people are giving to be vulnerable or to connect. Well, yeah, I mean, I it, it's, I mean, there's lots of, you could be in a group setting in a meeting situation and you have this idea and you're really excited about it or maybe you're nervous about it and you bring it up and like no one <laughs> acknowledges it or it just gets shot down or they're like, no, we're not doing that. We're we're not going to try that. Or it could be just as simple as um, you're sitting there having like a heart to heart with someone and they start, you know, texting someone on their phone. Like that's a denial. Totally. You know, and I mean, I'm sure there's tons of other examples. What waits um, on the other side that I think that a lot of people don't recognize, especially like in a business setting or even, yeah. a, even in a more formal setting, and maybe even in a parental yeah. you know, situation, is that even if something isn't logistically possible, mm -hmm. you know, because I can hear the the sort of counter argument of like, well, if we're in a meeting and we're trying to get stuff done and somebody brings up an idea that's not going to work, oh, then yeah. I have to tell them it's not going to work. Like I have okay. to deny it. But 
there are there's something that can come out of that idea mm-hmm. when someone feels validated, even if it logistically it won't work. Right. That's an idea of how like you connect brainstorming that can lead to another idea that can lead to another thing mm-hmm. that could actually solve the problem. Mm-hmm. But it but I I I think that a lot of people underestimate the sort of tone or emotional, I don't know, like atmosphere in a room yes. for someone to say, even if in the later in the discussion, they uh, generate another idea yeah. or think of another solution, yeah. they're less likely to say something or make that offering because it's constantly denied. Uh, for sure. It's not about the logistics of it. It's about the environment that you're creating of whether it will encourage yeah. or discourage creativity. I yeah, and 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 I what what's the difference? I wouldn't I mean, if someone in that situation in that meeting or whatever, um just the the difference between them saying, "We don't have time for that. We can't do that." Or oh man, we oh, I wish we had more time to talk about that idea. Um will you come by my office and we'll talk about that later? Just to make the person feel heard. I mean, if that were me, I'd be like, oh, okay, that, mm-hmm. that would just make all the difference in the world. And, you know, and so I think it's the same thing in our homes. Like, you know, a child says something and we're like, no, nope, no, we're not doing that. That's a bad idea. Or I mean, maybe we're not saying that's a bad idea, but that's what the kid is hearing, you know, like, oh, wait, I thought I was a part of this family and I, and it was a safe place and I, and I'm here to be heard like the rest of the family, you know, my older sibling says something and everyone listens to them. You know, everyone wants to feel heard and wants to feel validated. Like you said. Yeah, kids too, especially. And I think especially these days when there are so many distractions and their parents are always on their phones and they just want their parents to hear them and listen to them. And so I try to really, you know, if any of my kids wants to talk to me, I just try to, you know, to like stop everything and just listen. I turn off the TV. Yeah. turn my phone over yes and look them in the eye yeah even if it's 11:30 at night it's and i'd rather die at night. i'm just like okay this is really <laughs> important and surely i it's not going to kill me to stay up past my bedtime an hour it's fine but it, it's just so important to create that atmosphere because um i mean no one wants to walk into a situation where Either no one's listening or no one cares or you're shut down at every turn. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of us, you know, have experienced that at home or other places. And and so I just try to remember that when I think about my kids and how, you know, how do I... Because they're, they're going to experience it in the world. Yeah. You know, I don't All, need all to, the time. Yeah, exactly. And even if I think what they say is dumb... Oh, you know, yeah. it doesn't help anyone to say, "Well, that's the dumb idea," and, yeah, and that or would to be make a rude fun thing. of them, yeah, or, or, or to it just be like, help. "No," or or just or just not even listen, or just not even pay attention. You know. Okay, so let's do this. <laughs> this is a master class in okay. parenting, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know what you're going to say. Uh, we're going to improvise <laughs> different responses okay. for things that my kids have said to me that are oh. that they want to do. That's really dumb. Oh my gosh. And Lisa. you're okay. going to model this okay. this sort of like what okay. instead of saying what is I'm thinking inside. No, that's dumb. That's <laughs> dumb. Okay. Or I'm never going to let you do that. Okay. That's yeah. or dangerous or whatever. Yeah, cuz we're still parents. Cuz we're still parents and okay. safety is paramount. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, so okay. here's the situation. Okay. Mom. So, I know I'm in 10th grade and uh-huh. I just got my license. Okay. So me and my friends are going to take a like a backpacking trip. Mm-hmm. Um, we're but we're gonna get the, get in the cars. We're gonna go, um, and it's fine because all the other parents said yes. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna go uh, drive to California, and we're gonna go backpacking um, mm-hmm. in the desert. Okay, this summer it's gonna be awesome. Okay, um, that is that's really that's really cool. What I'm hearing is that <laughs> sorry, I'm trying not to laugh. I know. I'm like this is wow. So, These I are real you questions. know what I I'm really glad that you're telling me this because I didn't know like how much you loved backpacking. Um, yeah, I mean I've never been. Okay, but like okay, I, we, we yeah. yeah we're gonna like go shopping yeah. for food and okay. we're gonna do it ourselves. So here's the thing. So you know your dad like he used to go backpacking for like ten days at a time and it was like totally his thing. 
And so he knows everything how to do it. And I, you know, learned a couple things myself. So, you know, it'd be really fun. Like, what if we went, like, what if we went on like a dry run together? (laughs) It's like a family and we try it out to see if you really like it. Because I think it might be kind of a big commitment to commit to going and doing something with friends um, that you've never done before. Like, I think it could be something that we try you know, together first so oh, that we see. That was good. That was good. I didn't know where you were going to go. I didn't either. And I liked it because it's like I'm a dry a cool run doctor. and then they can see. Okay, that's going to help keep them safe. Oh man, I you're what a cool doctor response. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in chapter two, but we're not there yet. I like it. Okay, here's another scenario. But I have gone backpacking with my kids and I love it. It's fun. But, right, well, <laughs> <laughs> there's that. <laughs> In this scenario, it was me that was asked, and I hate backpacking. I know. That's what's funny. That's what's funny. It's like my <laughs> that's kids why you know. would not respond like me. I know. And this is why I need help. Oh, okay, and this I'll, is why I have you have friends, and you are vulnerable like, with well, them, and you uncle, tell them, yep, <laughs> just <laughs> so good. Jesse, you can go well, backpacking with them. Take them away. <laughs> okay, here's another scenario. Mom, okay. mom, mom. I think our dog Gus is really lonely and needs a friend. So I think we should get another dog and have that dog. Like I and and I I know a guy who is selling puppies and they're really cute. And come and look look at these pictures. And I think we should get another dog. Oh, I I love how much you love animals, Lisa. (laughs) It's it's really sweet. Um, You have such a big heart, and you have taken such good care of Gus, and he is so happy in our house. And I mean, I think we're we're all so busy and we all have so much going on. And oh man, I love Gus so much and he loves us. We all love Gus so much. I really think that if you need like more animal time, we should go, we should go over and play with those puppies. And like, but <laughs> like, I think that could be really fun. Um, I think we all could probably do a better job of like giving Gus more attention so he doesn't feel lonely. Um, but let's let's try that first and see if it changes. <laughs> see now, <laughs> that was a situation where we're both laughing because it's like the many f- phrases of no. I know, which I'm is sure. like we'll see or maybe later or in the future, but. You're right, though. Be, you focused on focus on the positive. the positive, which is you love animals, which is true. The child yes. who has approached me with this loves animals, yes, and I do think yes. it's a great characteristic. Yes, or yeah. a lot of times I throw myself under the yeah. bus and say I yeah. don't have the emotional capability to exactly. do this. So what will we do exactly. when I cannot? Just make it about them. Yeah, <laughs> or you could be like, <laughs> you love animals. That's so great. Is there? We need to call around and see if there's a place where you can go volunteer your time yeah. and get community service what hours for dog high walking school. Business. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Let's do that before we talk about Gus needing <laughs> Right. Let's not speak for the animals. This yeah. is no Dr. Doolittle situation here. Yeah. I'm going to shut like, that mm, part interesting. down. Interesting. No. That's yeah. not what Gus told me yesterday. Yeah. Gus told me he feels quite <laughs> frazzled with the emotional temperature in the home right now he and that he needs not. a little bit more alone time. Yes, exactly. So funny. That's we weird. might want to talk to Gus and get to the bottom of this because, exactly. yeah, I don't know. We're getting real mixed messages. Yep. Yep. Can you suggest a good dog therapist <laughs> in the area? <laughs> there you go. That works too. Uh, thank you for humoring me. Of this course. is why it, this is why improv saves lives it and does. relationships. It I'm does. gonna go that 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 far. All kidding aside, <laughs> I I know that improv is valuable to you, mm-hmm. and 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 we've had conversations about that. I would love for you to really be able to express, like, why improv has been especially valuable to you over your life in a way that's different than other the other things that you've done. Hmm. Okay. Well, first of all, just on a you know. A, a real, <laughs> well, vulnerable level. Please, this is what I'm, this is the offering I'm asking for. Be vulnerable. 
Um, improv has brought me some of my best friends in the world. And, you know, I, I can't say that that's like the nature of improv, that it it draws the most amazing people to it, but maybe. <laughs> but for me personally, like that's was just in the time of my life when I discovered it. That was just when I also probably just needed those lifelong friends that I would have for the rest of time. And all eternity. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and and so, I mean, just for that reason alone, um, that has been really meaningful. Um, and I, I mean, I think there is a reason for that. I think it does attract like-minded people, people who maybe... Maybe some do need a little attention. <laughs> Not all of us grew up very shy and introverted. <laughs> exactly. I wasn't going to say anything, but you know, it exactly. takes all kinds to but, actually see. I but, mean, but also, like you said, it gives you something to think about while you're doing the dishes, <laughs> you know. And if you're raising small children, like I was always so excited to go and do an improv show and have something to, to look forward to because yeah. you knew that the daily mundane tasks that you were doing that everyone has to do, whether they're a mom or not, really. Like, it had a purpose because you were collecting everything's material. And in the early 2000s, to take off my velour tracksuit and (laughs) (laughs) slip into a 1940s vintage dress and put on a hat, you know, that's something to look forward to at the end of the day. Totally. um, For sure. So just those, those are like very like basic reasons. Um... But also, I think there's just something to be said about about learning, about the listening aspect that we've talked about, and then just empathy overall. If you are really like exploring those characters and those relationships and those stories, you are putting yourself in so many other people's shoes. You are literally inserting yourself, like you know, into someone else's experience and trying it on and seeing what that's like, and so. I don't know. I've learned a lot just about, I don't know, human relationships and just different experiences that people can have. Um, but then, yeah, there's there's an effect, a natural effect of that. If, if you're practicing all the time, listening, listening at workshops, creating safe spaces, being positive, you have to take that into your real life. And so that's probably the ultimate takeaway is that I just, you know, try to every interaction I have with someone, really, I guess I would see them as my scene partner, my <laughs> improv scene partner. I do. It's so true. And though. I'm like, okay, my, make eye contact, mm-hmm. make them feel. <laughs> in improv, we play this game that I love. It's called Spine Line. And you get like a line um, and, and you just get a random line. Like um, you, I don't know, give me one. Like you're <laughs> just something that like your character intrinsically believes. Like um, everyone's out to get you could oh, be it, yeah. which is a negative one. Or you're the most important person in the room. That could be, you know, and so you get this line and you kind of put that in the back of your mind and like that will change how your character like acts and like makes choices. So the one that I kind of like take into my life or that I like to think is is a spine line for me. One of them is one that says, you matter to me. And so I try to think, you know, if I'm interacting with someone, I'm like, okay, how can I make them feel that they matter to me? I'm going to look at them. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to be positive. I'm going to build them up. I'm going to yes and them. What they say is not dumb. What they say is important. And so I think, I hope that I can do that in any interaction that I have. And now Haley will sing (laughs) You Matter to Me from the musical Waitress. I don't Take think it away. the copyright for that. We don't have the copyright. So I'll sing a different version. Let's pretend you, like... <laughs> you matter to me. <laughs> the Lisa Show is a production of BYU Radio. This week, our show is produced by Lisa Valentine Clark and McKay Menden. If you want to continue the conversations we started today, join our group on Facebook called The Lisa Show Listener Community. And don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Next week on the show... I still don't like to do laundry or, and I'm not, I'm not a mom that cuddles my kids. When they are sad, they, they almost go to their dad more than me. So I've just had to learn what, what I'm good at. And I've had to just come, I've had to be okay with the fact that I'm not the mom who bakes cookies for when my kids come home from school. I do other things for them. That's next week on The Lisa Show. The Lisa Show.